All right. Well, I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. I know it's a beautiful night out there, and there's, there's things you might rather be doing. But uh, I'm Dr. Bergman. This is Dr. Lundgren. And, and we constitute the vascular surgery department for the medical center. And one of the things that, that makes up a, a big part of our practice is, is a treatment of, of venous problems, uh, venous ulcers, leg swelling, varicose veins. So that's a little bit of what we're going to talk about tonight. And, and being the senior member of the department, um, I thought I would start out with, with some, of the, some of the history behind what we, what we do today. Um, the older I get, the more I find this, this stuff uh, interesting. Um, and if I can get, there we go. Uh, Robert Linton uh, was a, a surgeon at Harvard Medical School and he operated at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. And in the 50s, he, he was quoted with this saying uh, that, that, that basically says that the venous problems is something that has that has plagued the human race you know ever since we you know jumped out of the trees and started standing upright now if we were giraffes we wouldn't have this problem um, and maybe as time goes on you know we, we will evolve but but giraffes interestingly you think you would think that giraffes of all animals would have horrendous problems with varicose veins um, what, what our veins are, are these thin walled vessels that bring the blood back up our legs and our arms for that matter and they've got these flimsy little structures in, in them that are, that are called valves that's supposed to keep the blood moving up your leg back towards your heart. You, you would think that giraffes would have horrible varicose veins, but they don't. And the reason that they don't is that their skin and the soft tissues in their legs is so tight that, that it keeps the, the veins compressed. It doesn't allow them to balloon out like ours do. So it's as if you know giraffes were already born with their own compression stockings. Um, now, this is a, this is a page out of, of something that's called the Ebers Papyrus. Um, it, was, it was written, uh, we, we think, probably in about 1550 BC and, and, and may have been copied from, from documents that go back as far as 3400 BC. And it's a 110 page scroll and it has 700 or so remedies for different medical conditions. And some of the translation refers to what they called serpentine windings, which we believe probably referred to varicose veins. And it also reports some early experiences with, with surgery on these varicose veins. And the term, when it translates, said head, head to the ground. And what, what, what scholars think is that that probably means that when, when they first tried operating on these, you know, patients died. So... We, we, we're, we've come a long way. We've come a long way, yeah. Um, Hippocrates, um, in Greece, uh, the word varicose actually comes from the Greek that, that means grape-like. And um, he was kind of a happy-looking guy, as you can see. Um, probably because he was so frustrated with the treatment of, of venous problems. Um, but what he recommended was, was compression uh, bandages of some sort uh, following multiple punctures. And, and he, was, he was quoted as saying, you know, that which can't be cured by medicaments is cured by the knife. What cannot be cured by the knife is cured by the searing iron. That sounds pleasant. And whatever this cannot cure must be considered incurable. And um, this is a, a, a sculpture carving that was, that was found at the Acropolis in Greece. And um, it's the first uh, historical image that, that demonstrates varicose veins. This leg has this windy varicose vein down the, down the calf. Um, and then Hippocrates wrote this, this, this document called uh, De Ulceribus. And um, he says, in the case of an ulcer, uh, it's not expedient to stand, more especially if the ulcer is be situated in the leg, but neither also is it proper to sit and walk. So what do you do? I guess you just have to kind of lay down and keep your legs up all day if you, ha if you have a venous ulcer. Um, and he also referenced you know, putting different types of, of ointments on these, uh, but apparently you, you only do this in the summer and the winter. I don't know what you do in the spring and the fall. 
Um, the first, uh, the, the Alexandrian School of Medicine, this was, this was in Egypt, and this is where we first see a description of ligation of blood vessels. Uh, Celsus was, a, was a, a Roman physician in the first century, and he treated uh, varicose veins with excision, cauterization, and ligation. Galen in Rome uh, did similar uh, uh, ligations, but he also described making small incisions and reaching under the skin with hooks to, to pull out the varicose veins. Um, but this fella, uh, Marius, um, who had varicose veins treated in 86 BC, uh, was quoted as saying, I see the cure is not worth the pain. And then something that I, I just find fascinating is that from about 200 to about 1400, we hear nothing, there's nothing about varicose veins. It's written in any kind of medical literature. I mean, you think of the things we, we, we re see and, and read about today, you know, we have robotic surgery, we have new drugs, new procedures, new iPads, new iPhones, you know, all these different things. But for, for over a thousand years, you know, nothing was, nothing was reported in the medical literature that improved on what the Greeks and the Romans had done. And then we see in the Renaissance, Da Vinci, and um, you know, I think many of us have seen pictures in school or other places of, of his, his anatomic drawings. And um, Vesalius, um, who is another uh, Italian, um, did detailed anatomic drawings of the circulatory system. And, and these are remarkably similar to, to drawings that we see today. Now, if anybody can pronounce this guy's name, I, I'll give you 10 bucks. Um, Fabricius, um, he uh, was an uh, uh, anatomy professor in, in Padua. And in this uh, paper or manuscript that he uh, wrote, he was the first one to describe that, that our veins have valves and that the function of the valve is to, is to keep the blood moving up the leg. So he was the first one that recognized the importance of the vein valves. And then William Harvey, who was a, who was a British uh, physician who had trained with Fabricius, uh, Harvey was the first one who really kind of put together the, the whole circulatory system. You know, that, the, that the, the heart was a pump. It, plump, it pumped blood out through the arteries. The blood came back through the veins. And he also described some of the characteristics of, of blood. Um, but the surgeons at this time, you know, were referred to as, as the, this is the period where they call them the barber surgeons. Uh, Perret, who was in the 1500s, you know, again, did, did treatment for these that, that was very similar to what the, the Greeks and Romans did. Um, I find this heister in the 1700s, I thought this was kind of interesting, that, that he would recommend treating these with bleeding, a starvation diet, and the application of bandages to the legs so that the coats of the veins might be straightened. I mean, can you imagine? Okay, here's what we're gonna do. <laughs> we're gonna bring you in, we're gonna starve you, and we're gonna bleed you, and that's gonna, that's gonna take care of your varicose veins for you. But the, the, the barber, the, there, there really was a time where you know, barbers did a lot of, of medical work. And this is just a, you know, a cartoon that shows a, a barber you know, bleeding his patient. And these bloody rags are on, the, are on the rack back here. And we think that that's where the, the red and white pole from a, from a barber's office comes from. So if you really, you know, from the times of the, of the Greeks and the Romans, you know, up to the 1800s, really nothing had changed. And I think part of it is that most of these, these procedures were being done on people that were, that were awake. You know, there, there, were, there were probably some sort of narcotic you know, preparations that they could give people to, to sedate them. But, but most of these procedures were done basically with people awake, and I can imagine they were kind of thrashing around and moving. Uh, so people probably put up with a lot before they would subject, subject themselves to, to surgery for this. And I think this all changed in 1846. 
uh, William Morton was a, was a dentist, I believe, and he was the first one to, to use uh, general anesthesia with ether um, at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And, and you know, general anesthesia changed things tremendously for, for most of the stuff that we as surgeons do today. Really opened up a lot of doors for, for, for trying new procedures, uh, new techniques. So after, after the onset of general anesthesia, Trendelenburg um, talked about, uh, the reason I, I brought this, and he really didn't say anything that was new, but I thought it was interesting that after he would do these ligations for the veins, people were hospitalized for five weeks. Um, probably have, that hard, have a hard time getting that authorized uh, today. Um, in 1905, a physician named Keller uh, started using what's called an internal stripper. Um, this is an internal stripper. I borrowed it from Central Washington Hospital. <laughs> and what you do with this is you, you make an incision over the vein you're going to try to remove up in the groin. You pass the, the metal part down. It will go down the leg until it hits a, a, a functioning valve and you'll see or feel the skin stop. Uh, stop it, and then you make another incision, tie the vein at both ends, and you pull it out. So, and then um, the other the other thing that was new was Mayo um, reported using uh, external ringed strippers. We're not sure. These these may be external ring strippers. These again are from the hospital, and again you'd you'd uh, yeah you would you'd get the vein and then push it down to kind of free the vein up that way. So. And then um, Dr. Linton, that fellow that had the quote at the beginning of of, of the talk, um, he developed some some procedures to treat with some, some more specialized conditions. Now, um, the last slide I'm going to put in is just, you know, just because you can do something with general anesthesia doesn't always mean it's the right thing to do. And, and there was a procedure that was, oh, sorry, I, I, I'm a little ahead of myself, a little ahead of myself. The, the other way to treat uh, varicose veins um, uh, is with uh, injection sclerotherapy. That's where you inject a chemical irritant into the vein. Uh, and the goal is to make the vein clot, and then over time we hope the clot shrinks, the, the vein shrinks, and, and fibrosis, and, and more or less uh, forms a little band of scar tissue. This was, this was uh, tried in the 1800s um, using incredibly uh, caustic uh, substances that would result in severe phlebitis uh, inflammation, oftentimes sloughing of the skin, uh, gangrene of the skin. So in the 1890s, um, it was decided at that point that, that um, I don't know if they could actually outlaw that practice, but it was, it was strongly discouraged. Um, a, a German dermatologist named Una uh, also developed some elastic uh, bandages with a, a glycerin gelatin mixture. Um, and I don't know if you can read this, but this is a this is a current product that we use, and it and it even today it says Unaboot. So this is what the wrap from an Unaboot is like. And then I think I think finally um, a procedure that I'm I'm showing is just just to be condemned was something called the Rindfleisch operation. Um, this operation involved uh, stripping the saphenous vein from the groin to the knee and making this spiral incision, you know, four to six times around the lower leg to, to interrupt the, the veins and, and hopefully cause the varicose veins to shrink and fibrose. But, you know, people were end, ended up with legs looking like that. And I don't think any of you in here today um, would would uh, would sign up for a procedure like that. So that's a little bit of history of, of, of how far back this goes. 
and some of the stuff that, that, that's been tried uh, and used over the last couple thousand years. And uh, now I'd like to give it to Dr. Lundgren so she can tell you, show you how far we've come and what, with what finesse we treat these conditions now. So I am absolutely fine with you stopping me and asking me questions during this. And if you have questions at the end also, I'm very happy to take questions. So the first question is, well, how big is the problem of varicose veins? And the answer is it's actually a really big problem. When you look at most developed countries like here, Canada, Europe, um, 16 to 40 percent of the adult population has some kind of venous disease, most of which are varicose veins. And when you actually look at the incidence, it's two times more common than heart disease. Obviously not as lethal, but incredibly common. And almost all of us can think of a family member who had pretty impressive varicose veins that we noticed when we were younger and, you know, kind of ooh, not over. You see the guy walking down by the river and you think, whoa, those are some varicose veins. So they're actually really common. And what's interesting is of the millions of people in this country who have varicose veins and vein disease, very few of them actually go for treatment. So this is something that people frequently suffer with and kind of suffer silently and don't come and get medical care. If we look at people who have even worse vein disease, they can start developing things like skin changes and sores. And those are called venous ulcers or venous stasis ulcers, and you may have heard that before. And stasis just means because things are sitting, they're static. Actually, 1% of the population will develop a venous ulcer in their lifetime. So while it's not huge, it's not like varicose veins, it's actually a lot of people. And after healing one ulcer, a third of people will develop another one in a couple years, and 50% of them will develop another one within five years. So not only is it fairly common, but it's a chronic disease, like many other chronic diseases that we have, and we need to treat it as such. So not only is it chronic, it's expensive, and it costs billions of dollars in developed countries to treat venous ulcers. And so it's actually a really important issue that a lot of people don't pay attention to. And I think one of the most important reasons why this issue really matters, and part of why I'm talking about it today for all of you, is because when you look at people's quality of life who have these venous ulcers or chronic severe venous disease, they rate their quality of life as bad as people with congestive heart failure and cancer. So this is something that really affects how people do when they have really bad vein disease. So as far as vein anatomy goes, Dr. Bergman talked about this a little bit. The, the blood in the veins starts down, for example, in the foot, and here's a foot, and up here's the hip and the groin, so we're working up towards the head. So the blood in the veins starts down in the toes and then runs up towards the heart. And because of that, it's working against gravity. There's both deep veins, and in this picture, they're the dark blue ones, and those are the ones that live in the muscle, and if you've ever heard of the big scary blood clots like the deep venous thrombosis, DVT, those are the ones that live in the muscle. The varicose veins and veins that tend to cause venous disease are the shallow veins, and in this picture, they're the light blue ones, and they're the ones that live right underneath the skin or in the skin itself. So if you think about the blood flowing up against gravity, if you've ever tossed your kid brother out the window or a ball or something like that, you know how fast it falls, and gravity is a really strong force. So what veins have developed are valves, and the valves help prevent the flow from running down to the foot with gravity. The vein in a normal leg, in most of our legs here, hopefully in this room, um, it's a low flow, low pressure system. So unlike arteries that pump the blood out and you see it pulsatile you know, in the movies and it sprays, <coughs> veins don't normally do that. And so therefore, there isn't anything like a heart to push the blood around. And so the flow in the veins occurs for a couple of reasons. One is because in your calf muscle, so if you look at the muscles in the back of your calf, your gastrocnemius, when those muscles squeeze, when you're walking or climbing stairs, they literally squeeze the veins and it pushes the blood back up towards the heart and it gets to the next level and then the valves close and prevent the blood from going backwards. So one of the really important things about vein flow is that it is improved by muscle contraction. The other thing is once it makes it up to your tummy, your abdominal organs like your guts moving around actually helps the blood get back to your chest. And then in your chest, whenever you breathe, you're creating a vacuum. You're creating negative pressure. It's what helps open your lungs. And it's the same thing. It helps suck that blood back up so it can dump back into your heart. Um, 
So then when you look at vein disease, there's two major problems in vein disease. There's when the vein doesn't work right and the flow drops with gravity towards the feet. And then there's when the vein itself is blocked in some way and the blood can't get forward. And that's called obstruction. Most people who we see in our clinic have reflux. So their veins, they, they, they're incompetent. They flow backwards. And what, what we've realized, we used to think it was a problem with the valves. It's actually not so much the valves, it's the veins. The veins themselves get weak and they dilate over time and the valves can't come together anymore and the blood just flows with gravity and flows down towards the feet. Um, and what they, they've actually done an interesting study is they've taken people with varicose veins and they've taken samples of veins in areas that aren't varicose, like their arm, and they have the same genetic problems in those veins too. So it seems to be a full body thing, but because of the gravity and the incredible force of gravity, we see it in the legs first. Occasionally I'll see someone with a varicose vein in their arm, but that's pretty rare. Um, so people who get clots or scars in their vein, they can clog up the vein, make it a lot harder for the little trickle of flow to try and get past, and that's called obstruction. Either way, you have kind of the same end problem, which is the flow just can't get back to the heart, and it all ends up pooling like a clogged sink or a clogged drain in somewhere like your skin or your legs, and that literally leads to what's called venous hypertension, where you get high blood pressure in your veins. And over time, the fluid in the veins can leak out and leak into the skin. And that's part of what causes the skin changes and the sores and all of that is because of this venous hypertension. So when you look at who gets vein disease, I've highlighted heredity already because we're more and more we're thinking that a lot of this is genetic and it's just kind of your bum luck and it's what you get. And frequently you have family members who have veins and it's kind of, it's not like you could have done something differently and prevented your varicose veins. And the reason why this is important is because when you look at people who have had vein surgery, even if everything has worked beautifully, 30% of them have more varicose veins in three years because it's just a genetic problem and you're going to get more of them. And so I think that's something important when I tell my patients for them to know. But other things obviously are gender. More women have varicose veins than men. It's not hugely different and men catch up as they get older, but, but it is more common in women. We're not sure if it's hormones or if it's pregnancy or what it is that makes it more common. Um, as people get older, they're more likely to have vein disease. And so this certainly increases starting in about the 40s is when we start seeing people come in more often. Obviously, pregnancy, so pregnant women are much more likely to have varicose veins. They're often incredibly bad during the pregnancy and then get better afterwards. I've seen some amazing varicose veins in women. They go away after they're done with pregnancy. But the more pregnancies women have, often the worse their varicose veins get. People who stand for long periods of time, I've talked to cooks, for example, who are just standing in front of the stove for hours, and it's precisely because of that calf muscle squeezing. And if you're standing and it's not squeezing and you're not walking, all the blood just pools. And so that's often why people who stand a lot have worse symptoms. Obesity is directly related to vein disease, and there's probably tons of reasons why, but one of which is that all that weight sitting there in the tummy doesn't allow the blood to get back up to the heart. And so it's very often we see people with super bad vein disease who are obese, and part of it might be related to sedentary lifestyle too. So people who have had injuries to their vein or surgeries that have involved their veins or damaged the veins, they can have vein disease. People who sit a lot, either because they're heavy or because they're not working their calves. That's the same thing. And sometimes I get patients who say, yeah, you know, when I'm working all day, I'm sitting at my desk, and then I get up and take a walk, and my legs feel better. And it's precisely because of that reason. And I do encourage people to walk for precisely that reason. And then finally, people who have had clots, either in their shallow veins near their skin or in their deep veins in their muscles, can have worsening vein disease. So then when you think about the symptoms that people commonly present with, and there's a whole variety of symptoms, but classically what people describe are, wow, I've got this cramping, aching, throbbing pain in my leg. It feels like it's tight and it's stretching. Sometimes they get itching. The varicose veins themselves can become more distended over the day and hurt. Some people get swelling down, usually at their ankle, but sometimes up into their calf. Um, and what most of this 
is common is that it's worse by the end of the day, it's better if people put their legs up, and it's better in the morning after they've been sleeping and lying flat. And so those are kind of some classic signs and symptoms. And then obviously some people get to the point where they actually have skin discoloration. And I've met a whole bunch of, you know, I'll talk to the guy, I'll be like, oh, my legs have been brown for 10 years. And you know, it's, and so people will ultimately, um, and some people end up with skin discoloration or texture changes where their skin gets hard and woody, usually down by their ankle. So when you look at someone at point zero and they've got a varicose vein, what happens to them over time? And this is an important topic that actually, literally, I went to this conference a month ago and they're just publishing data on this. So you think it's been around for bazillions of years, we would have figured this out already. No one's ever done a scientific study looking at populations over time until now. And so they've, they've followed people in Scotland and in Germany. And basically they found what is common sense, which is veins get worse over time. And so if you look at a population, the population develops vein disease at a rate of about 1% of the population per year or 20% of the population over 13 years. So again, progressive and common. But more importantly is that if you have someone with varicose veins, within six years, 20 to 30% of them have worsening vein disease. And, and I point this out, and at some point, you know, if I have time and energy, I'm going to talk to the government and insurance companies about this, because a lot of insurance companies will protest paying for vein surgery because they say it's cosmetic. But in fact, if you think about this, almost a third of patients are going to have worsening vein disease and can end up with some really scary vein disease over time, which is why I think it's important to treat it before it gets too bad. Um, so... This is a little bit busy, but I think it's important partially for the pictures I'm going to show you. In medicine, we like classification systems. It helps us define what kind of disease someone has and what we need to do about it. And the SEEP classification is what we use for venous disease. And what I'm talking about right now is the C portion, which is the class. And basically, you start at someone who has no vein disease, and you go to people who have big open wounds. So it gets worse as it progresses. And when you look at class 1, these are the people with the little spider veins that you see usually on the thighs or the side of the thighs, back of the thighs. And what these are, are these are essentially varicose veins, but they're the little ones in the skin. And they can certainly cause symptoms. They don't usually cause big scary clots or wounds or things like that, but they can certainly be symptomatic. And I've noticed, at least this is my personal experience, I don't know if this is true or not, is it seems like some people get more varicose veins and some people get more spider and reticular veins. And often they don't cross. It's like it's a different presentation of the disease. So the next class is kind of a little bit worse are varicose veins, and this person happens to have a very large, juicy one because I wanted to show you something obvious, um, but they don't have to be this big, and this is the next step. And then as you're getting a little bit worse, some people get swelling. I couldn't find a good ankle swelling. Most people with vein disease do not necessarily have foot swelling. It's usually at their ankles. And then over time, people can progress to actual skin changes. And you can see the discoloration and the dryness. Here, some people actually get inflammation of the veins in the skin and they can get literally an eczema that itches and they get kind of red sores. I've seen some people just have red skin. Um, and some people get kind of like a purple discoloration instead of the brown. And when I see this on legs, this is all signs to me of, oh, you've got chronic vein disease. Okay, this, is, this puts you in a different group. Um, there are people who don't have major vein disease, but do have chronic lymph disease or chronic heart disease that leads to chronic swelling that can lead to some of these skin changes too. And then finally, you have people who can have healed ulcers. So they had sores in the past and they have scars. The scars are usually down by the ankle on the inner side. They can be elsewhere, but that's kind of the classic place. Um, and usually they're either a white scar or they're kind of a darker colored scar like this one. And then you have the people with the open sores. So so that's kind of the progression of vein disease. Remember, of course, that most people with varicose veins continue to have varicose veins and they don't get sores, okay? Only 1% of people get sores, but it is something that over time people can get kind of, they can go from this to this to this, and so it is something to think about. So as far as treatment goes, um, if any of you have come and seen a vascular surgeon for your veins, what we'll usually tell you is your insurance company requires you wear compression stockings for three months before they're willing to pay for surgery. And basically it's their way of weeding people out because they want to see if they actually come back. And they make the patients pay for the compression stockings so that they don't have to pay for it, and then they see if you come back in three months. That being said, compression is actually important. And it's important for a couple reasons. One is it helps with the symptoms, but perhaps more importantly, in people who have really bad vein disease, like the skin changes 
changes in the sores. It really helps heal and reduce the severity of the ulcers. What you're looking for in a compression stocking is that you're looking for something that's stronger at the ankle than it is at the knee or the thigh or your pantyhose level or whatever you choose to get. And the reason why is that it's literally milking the flow back up to the heart. So it's doing what your veins should have been doing but aren't. And why that's important is it helps reduce that hypertension, that high pressure that people get in their skin and in their veins and it helps squeeze everything back out. So it actually helps the texture of the skin. It can help prevent those ulcers from forming. And so compression in some people is actually really important. And in some people who either don't have much vein disease or who are standing for hours and hours and hours at a time, compression stockings may really help with their symptoms. And so in some people, they are really useful, apart from the fact that insurance companies make people wait three months. And deep veins, when people have problems with those veins in their muscle, those are hard to treat. And frequently it's because of clots and they've got scarring in the veins and they have really bad leg disease, but you can't just go in and scoop it out because it's become a scar. It's hard to rebuild valves. We're trying, but we're still not there yet. And so this is something that's really only done at very specialized centers and most people end up wearing compression stockings. So the people in whom we can do something surgically and actually make a measurable difference in their lives is the people with the shallow veins, with these light blue veins, the superficial veins. And the two ones that tend to cause problems are called the great and small saphenous veins. The great saphenous vein starts about your ankle. It runs over your ankle bone, and if it gets hot out, you may see it. And it runs up your inner calf, inner thigh, all the way up to your groin, where it joins in with your deep veins. And that's the number one vein that causes varicose veins and causes problems. Um, and then the small saphenous vein runs down the back of your calf, between your two heads of your gastrocnemius, of your calf muscle. You have a small saphenous vein there, too. And we're realizing more and more that that can also cause symptoms and varicose veins and problems, too. So if those are having, um, if this is related to the disease process, we can also treat those. So in the old days, we used to do a variety of cautery and stabbing and burning and torture. And then we moved to stripping, which Dr. Bergman passed around. And I actually even, at the VA, they still do stripping. So I actually did learn how to do stripping. But at this point, it's kind of a dinosaur. <clears throat> and... Uh, <laughs> And um, so usually in this day and age, for the past 10 years, we've been doing something called a closure or laser closure of veins. And basically what you're doing is you're using heat and energy to close a saphenous vein. And what Dr. Bergman and I use is what's called radiofrequency energy or ablation. Um, but all of them work essentially the same way. What you're doing is you're getting into a saphenous vein, the greater the small, and you're putting in a plastic tube or catheter. And Dr. Bergman was kind enough to bring one. I don't think this has been used on anybody. And this is what this is actually what we use in this day and age. Um, this is eventually. Um, at the tip of this, and you'll see the gold part. I don't think it's real gold, so please don't steal it. Um, but this is the part that I'll, that heats up. And the rest of it is just how you get in. Um, the little button at the end, it's awesome. This is obviously made for geniuses. You press the button, it heats up. So I'm going to let you pass that around. So overall, once you get the thing in, it's a pretty straightforward procedure. So you put it up the saphenous vein. You press the button. That end filament heats up to boiling and boils the vein. And the vein scars down and closes. So that's, that's how we do a closure technique. Um, so one of the relevant questions, and patients have asked me this, is, okay, so you're, you're closing the saphenous vein. Well, what happens to my varicose veins then? You know, and I mean, that's a very important question. And they've actually studied this in Europe. And uh, what they found was that 33% of people, their varicose veins went away just by closing the saphenous vein. Because once you didn't have that reflux, once all the blood wasn't dropping backwards, well, then the veins could deflate and go back to being normal. But what they also found is that two-thirds of people didn't get better and did need more surgery. So, and they also found that in the people who didn't get the surgery right off, they weren't as happy. So basically, basically, patients were happier if you treated them right off the bat. So usually, and this is a person-dependent thing, and every patient's a little different, and you have to weigh their medical problems and their age and what their varicose veins look like and stuff like that. But in general, if you have big, juicy varicose veins, it's probably better if you just get them treated at the same time. Most patients are happier. You don't have to. 
Um, and this is how we do it. And I hope these pictures don't make anyone too ill. But there's two techniques, and to be honest, there's no real difference between these. The classic is called a stab phlebectomy, and phlebectomy just means removing vein. And you make little skin holes, and you pull out, and let her pull out the vein. And then you have a machine that can do it called the Trivex. And it's kind of cool because it lights up the vein so you can actually see what you're taking out. But the concept is the same, and the functional results are the same as well. Okay. Yes. And that's not stripping. That it's it, that is technically not strip. It is, I mean it is. But when you when people say, "Oh, I had my vein stripped," that's their saphenous vein. The large. The large one. Oh, okay. This is small. And these are a lot of small. I mean, no matter how you do it, it's a bunch of small cuts. Um, so coming back, so we just talked about varicose veins. Let's come back to ulcers again, in case any of you have family members with ulcers. Um, and, and here's why I mention this. So compression, very, very important. But it turns out surgery is helpful too. And here's how surgery is helpful. They did this trial, and they took patients with sores, with open sores, and they put them in two groups. One got compression, and one got shallow vein, superficial vein surgery on their great or small saphenous veins, and compression. And what they found is that the surgery did not change how fast the ulcer healed, but it did dramatically change how many people got more ulcers in the future. And so I look at this as a fantastic way to try and prevent patients from having future problems once they get that sore healed. And that's why I feel like it's really important that we treat people who have ulcers who have had them in the past. Um, but the only thing we know of that heals ulcers is compression, and that's why compression therapy is important and why I know I emphasize well, I think both of us emphasize it. Um, okay, so after you have a vein closure, uh, what can you expect? It depends on how many varicose veins you have removed, but if you're just having the closure, most people do really well. You have a little bit of soreness, a little bit of bruising, a little swelling. Some people, when the vein starts to scar down in their thigh, they get a tight cord-like feeling because it's literally a scar, and they complain about it. They're like, wow, it's like a rubber band in my leg when I walk. That's really normal. And occasionally, there's a nerve that runs by the vein, and occasionally, people can get some temporary numbness in their leg. But for the most part, the vast majority of patients that I see, after about three, four, five days, they're fine. If you start removing a whole bunch of varicose veins and there's a bunch of bruising and you know soreness and swelling, eh, it takes a bit longer to get better. And I've found that patients, it takes them a good two to four weeks to say, okay, I'm, I'm ready to go back to my exercise class and start running around and feeling really good. They can work, they can do their stuff that they need to around their house, but they're not feeling great for at least a couple weeks. And so that's something else that I talk with patients about as far as their jobs and their ability to be limping a little bit for a while. Okay, so in conclusion, vein disease, incredibly common. Lots of people have it. Many patients have reflux, so the blood goes the wrong direction in their shallow veins, which are usually their great and small saphenous veins in their leg, and there's a day surgery. This is an outpatient surgery that can treat it, and the people who are symptomatic really help their symptoms. Treating shallow veins and superficial veins may prevent progression to more serious vein disease, as they're showing now in some of the population studies. And closing those saphenous veins can reduce the recurrence of vein ulcers. So thank you very much. And I'd be happy to take questions. Question? Yes. Do, I have a bunch of them on, on my thighs, and I'm 81. Yes. But they never hurt or had any of those ulcers or anything? Should I... Treat them, or I mean, yeah. Well, no, it's a really good question. Um, I, I would say, and, and we can also get Dr. Bergman's opinion, I would say that as long as your legs aren't swelling too much and you're not getting those skin color changes or anything else that's kind of scarier, I'd just leave them alone. <laughs> Walk. Elevate your legs. What do you do to prevent getting them in the first place? You can't. <laughs> that's the problem. You can't prevent it. It's, I mean, it, we wish we could. And so we, we put up those risk factors, you know, female gender, standing profession. But to be honest, it doesn't seem to make a big difference what you do. It just happens. You just pick your parents better. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> if a person that has varicose veins and has a burning and itching in the large, large veins, um, if those veins are treated, with surgery, and if a patient has Raynaud's, what are the complications uh, to Raynaud's? I haven't, um, I haven't seen any any problems with, you know, making the Raynaud's worse or different. 
In fact, I, I, off the top of my head, I, I can't even remember treating someone that had varicose veins and brain nods. But from a, from a medical physiologic standpoint, they, they, the two shouldn't affect one another. Right. The, 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 so, because Raynaud's, which I'm sure you know, but Raynaud's affects arteries, and it affects arteries in the fingers and the toes, and we're treating veins. Um, I have seen some, the veins tend to spasm during surgery, and that's a normal thing because they get pissed off when, because you're, you're, you know, burning them, so they get upset. Um, and, and so it is hypothetical that someone with Raynaud's, if they're already spasming, and some people do have a Raynaud's reaction to stress. So if they're stressed, you may have a temporary worsening of Raynaud's symptoms that then should get better once you're feeling better and the stress is gone. Does... Uh... What about uh, cold or, or heat, you know, like my wife here, she'll come home and, uh, you know, I have a reminder to elevate the clay. What, does ice packs or heat, is, is there any advantage of putting ice on or? Not, not that we know of. Um, in general, people who are in heat, because your veins dilate in heat, their symptoms get worse. And that's kind of a classic thing. People say, oh, God, in summer, it's really bad. You know? And of course, in summer is when it sucks to wear the compression stockings the most because you're, you know, it's hot outside. But the, the, to my knowledge, there's nothing that shows that ice makes much of a difference. It's mainly the elevation. What about, what about type of shoes? <laughs> Actually, I love this story. So um, I, don't, I don't endorse high heels because they do cause structural damage to your foot and they do cause Achilles tendon shortening. But um, if all, I, I, I tell this story to my patients anyway. I love this story. So um, Brazil has one of the highest rates of elective cosmetic surgery in the world. People are very invested in looking good in Brazil. So this study could only have happened in Brazil. They took women with vein disease and they put them on a treadmill. And then they measured how well their veins emptied. There's a certain way you can, certain tests you can do to check that. And they checked them walking flat-footed and walking in three-inch high heels. Which one emptied better? High heels. Because you work harder. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Especially when you fall. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly right. Yes. What about clotting issues post on? Good, good question. Um, one of the risks of this surgery, because the saf if you're working, well, either one, both saphenous veins as shallow veins empty into the deep venous system. And when we put that catheter up to burn the vein, we're very careful to move it back an inch so that we don't burn the deep veins by accident. That being said, there's still about a 1% to 4% chance of causing a deep vein blood clot. What's interesting about them is that they seem to act differently. So that unlike the deep blood clots that people get after a big surgery, like a belly surgery or trauma or cancer or things like that, these ones don't tend to break off and go to the lungs. And also they tend to go away with anticoagulation quickly. So that in people, normally when people have a blood clot, like a deep one, if, you, if you've had family members or you yourself, you're on blood thinners for three to six months. These almost always go away within two to three weeks. So it's a, it's a different kind of clot. Yes, Dr. Bergman. I've, I've seen a handful of people that we, we um, when we're evaluating people preoperatively, we will get an ultrasound exam, we call it a reflex test. And it just, all we're really looking for is the direction of flow in the vein. If, if the blood's flowing up, we know the valves are working. If the blood's flowing down, we know the valves aren't. Post-op, we do all these procedures on Fridays. And then we, we try to get everybody to come in Monday for an ultrasound of the vein that we closed off. And one of the things we look for, so if, if this is the saphenous vein and it's now closed off, you know, our catheter has stopped here. There's a, there's a vein that kind of heads up towards your groin area. And if your deep vein is here, we, we, I have seen a few people that have had a clot that kind of forms in this little, this little cul-de-sac and, and, and a couple where the clot has started to go out into, into mm -hmm. the deep vein. And there's, a, there's some controversy as to what you do. The first few of these I saw, I got all excited and I put people on blood thinners and I left them on blood thinners for about six weeks and, and I'd study them again at six weeks and with the exception of one patient, the, the clot was always gone. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen one patient um, where you know, the clot was larger 
and and that person stayed on blood thinners for about six months. Um, but I've been doing these now for for you know, this will be 11 years, and I've seen one patient that has had a clot like that. So, so it's something we tell people about, but the risk is. is the here. the one other thing that I, I will mention um, as a kind of side to your question is that there are some people who come to us who are already on blood thinners because of previous clots that they've had in their deep veins, who have what are called hypercoagulable conditions where their blood is more likely to clot because of again bad genetics, and those people are at increased risk for clotting, kind of no matter what you do to them. And some people do put them on um, shots, on Lovenox shots, around their surgery time to reduce that risk of a deep clot. Does it cause leg cramps? Oh, sure, absolutely. Cramps, heaviness, throbbing, achy, burning. I mean, the, 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 not, the common, the veins are, are, are stretched, and the veins have stretch receptors, but we might all sense that differently. Some people don't have any symptoms. Some people are... are, are almost disabled by their symptoms. She, one other thing I wanted to mention, she mentioned insurance companies and the, and the compression stockings. Um, 10 or 15 years ago, you know, we, we, we kind of play a cat and mouse game with the insurance companies, um, and, and people kind of find a niche that they can jump into where they're, where they're doing something and the reimbursement is, is, is good. So 10 or 15 years ago, um, Reimbursement for varicose vein procedures was 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 phenomenal, and and vein centers were opening all over the country, and, and they they could be very lucrative, um, and and a lot of these centers would, would bill insurance, and and the insurance companies finally pick up on the fact that all these people are getting treated for varicose veins, we're paying out all this money, and and the insurance company's reaction is to is to really kind of clamp down, so we're in a period now for the last three years where we have to jump through a lot of hoops to get people authorized authorized for surgery. I looked at one company's policy, Regents, just not to pick on any one, but <laughs> that's the one I have to look at. And, and Regents has 15 pages of, of definitions and this and that and this and, and stuff you have to go through um, and document in order to get treatment authorized. What I thought was fascinating was that if you were a Regents patient and you needed a heart transplant, there was only nine pages. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we're in this period where we have to, we see people, we know, you know, or I have a sense that, you know, this person is going to be best served by surgery. You know that. But since people have kind of abused the system, the, the insurance companies, they won't let us do anything now until we can document use of compression stockings for at least three months. Most of them make us copy the prescription, fax it to them to prove that we wrote it in the first place. We can't just dictate that we wrote it. So. You mentioned that, um, I think it's about three years later, sometimes people get some things again. Do you ever do that procedure more than once, the closure? Yep. It's not at one time and then... Okay. Yeah. One thing that was popular, uh, before, so when I started here uh, 19 years ago, uh, we did, you know, vein strippings. You know, make an incision here, pass one of those things down, pull the thing out. Um, there was a period of time where just going in and lighting mm -hmm. the vein, if, if, the, if, you, if the problem starts with the sap and it's made up here, well, it made sense to just go in and make a little incision up here ligate it, you eliminate the backwards flow, problem solved. But what we discovered after five or ten years was that fully 30 or 40 percent of people that had just had ligation came back in at some point with more symptoms. And if you study them with ultrasound, sometimes that thing was wide open again. So, you know, it wasn't, and then ten years ago, these catheters and these other systems, you know, finally were available for, for general use. And, but some of the insurance companies have kind of lagged behind in authorizing that, too. So. Mm -hmm. Let's say after about eight months of your like ablation, 
you feel like you have a, a muscle strain at the top. I mean, could it be a muscle strain or could it be from the ablation? If, you, if you've had the ablation, rough, you know, roughly 8 to 10 percent of people, that vein may open up again over time. So if someone has had an ablation and they come back with any kind of funny symptom, the first thing I'll do is get another ultrasound just to see if the vein has in fact stayed closed. Mm -hmm. um, if it's open again, like we said, you know, we can treat it a second time. Sometimes it's hard to get the catheter up because there'll be little webs of scar tissue on the way up, but you certainly can treat it a second time. Um, if, if, if the vein looks good and, the, and there's nothing else obvious, then uh, are, you, are you getting something specific? <laughs> <laughs> I have a, every once in a while I have a little pain up there Still at the pain. top, uh -huh. and it's like a muscle strain, but I haven't strained my muscle because I don't work out like that. Mm -hmm. But So I'm wondering if it has anything to do with the ablation. It's hard to say. I'm, Waiting. <laughs> I just think what's going Yes, and back. Can um, the varicose vein cause the leg to slightly bow? I've heard that. I don't think so. Because that, that would take a fair amount of bone change. And, and that would have to, I mean, uh, all things are possible under the sun, but that would have to be like a really impressive like vein malformation to cause that to happen. I have a question <clears throat> concerning diabetes and doing mm -hmm. this uh, procedure. Is there any increase in, you know, the leg uh, suffering from doing this procedure and having diabetes so that, as we know, that's amputations are done? Sure. No, great. that's a great question. Um, I, the short answer is no. Um, because a lot of people with diabetes, when they have leg problems, it's because of their arteries, and we're tr this is treating veins, so it's a little different. That being said, diabetics don't tend to heal wounds quite as well. If people do have really bad artery disease, then we do need to think about how many little cuts we're going to make in them. I mean, these are little cuts. It's not like it's a huge, you know, fillet, so that's good. Um, and, and so, but we do, sometimes we'll see someone who, you know, we always check the arteries when we're examining people, too. And if someone has really significant artery disease, oh, well, oh, maybe we don't want to make a whole bunch of cuts on them. And also, the better controlled people's sugars are around surgery, the less of a chance of infection. So what happens to the blood if you close Well, that's a great off. question. <laughs> Smart. <laughs> Dr. Bergman, want to take away? The problem is that the, the blood is flowing the wrong way to begin with. So if people, people ask this all the time. Well, if you close off this vein, well, what's going to happen? Well, the blood is flowing the wrong way down this vein anyway. The, the surface veins, all of them, only bring about 10% of the blood back up your leg. 90% or so is going up through those deep veins that are down in the muscle. So even though you've got these huge ones on the surface and they look horrible, there's not much blood moving through them. So you can do all kinds of stuff to them, and as long as you know the deep veins are working, the you know, don't worry about the surface veins. Um, and eventually, you know, if there is... At different levels, there are there are there are veins that connect the the surface veins and the deep veins. So if you close off the saphenous vein from the groin to the knee, the blood from further down, you know, it gets up and it, it, it goes in. They, they go in through other other channels. They're already there. So when you have a solution put into a very close vein, mm -hmm. and how long does it take for it to be good? <laughs> so when you, when you do injection sclerotherapy, you're, you're injecting a chemical irritant into the vein with the goal of, of making the vein clot. You, you're creating a phlebitis. So uh, the vein clots, and, and it'll get red and sore and tender and, and hard to touch because of all that inflammation around it. And if it's the little small spider veins, uh, the little blue ones, you know, sometimes those will be gone and disappeared in, in a matter of weeks. Um, if it's a big ropey varicose vein, uh, sometimes it can take four to six months. Okay. 
Well, thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you very much.